Hello and welcome back. Last time we passed through St. Mark's Park where we checked out some of artist Anthony Gormley's pieces, explored the vast green spaces, and experienced the serenity of Red Bray's Weir. This time we stumbled into the spooky yet enchanting Warston Cemetery. Join us as we learn about some of its famous occupants that include a man that changed medical history and the curious tale of the Tomb of the Red Lady. Warriston is a suburb of Edinburgh, and this cemetery lies east of the Royal Botanic Garden on the north bank of the Water of Leith. Designed by Edinburgh architect David Cousin, the cemetery opened in 1843 and occupies around 14 acres of sloping land, which was formerly divided by the Edinburgh and Leith Railway, of which only a footpath and majestic Gothic bridge remain. This space was constructed and owned by the Edinburgh Cemetery Company, a private company that formed in 1840. In my research, I read that the inner city cemeteries of the time had become overcrowded, cramped, and chaotic. So it was the new vogue to be put to rest in what were deemed as garden cemeteries, offering large and contemporary plots to the upper class. It was kind of like offering people a life out in the fresh air and countryside, just without the life. The cemetery was in private ownership until 1994, when it was compulsory purchased by the City of Edinburgh Council. But it was a huge undertaking. Fortunately, thanks to a group called the Friends of Orston Cemetery, the long task of restoring the heavily overgrown and vandalized cemetery has begun. But as you can see, still has far to go. This grave belongs to John Menzies, who started out as a bookstore owner on Princess Street, then went on to start a massive distribution company, and now you may know him as the name behind Menzies Aviation. Locals tell me Menzies is properly pronounced Mingus. The next grave we're going to find belongs to William Peck. Peck worked at Cox's Glue Factory in his youth, and if you've been following along on this adventure, you may recognize the name because it was the same factory where John Cox had masterminded the magnificent Royal Patton Gymnasium. I reckon that Peck must have not been that great at glue production or really talked a good game in the outer space department, because despite having any formal education in astronomy, his boss Robert Cox asked him to come lecture and oversee his soon-to-be-open private observatory. Talk about a career progression. In 1883, he began lecturing in astronomy, and then, six years after that, he was made the director of the Edinburgh City Observatory, which he held for the rest of his life. In case you don't know, the observatory is located on top of Calton Hill overlooking the city, and he actually got to call the observatory house his home. A few years later, after the electrification of the city, light pollution from the newly installed street lamps pushed their operations to have to move to the Blackford Hill Observatory just outside of town. Fortunately for William Peck, though, he was able to keep his house on top of the hill. Harnessing that newly abundant electricity that had relocated his place of work, Peck also founded one of the first factories to manufacture electric cars in 1898. He called it the Maldelvik Motor Carriage Company, but sadly the future didn't accelerate quite as they planned, and they ceased production in 1900. When he wasn't looking up at the stars or creating patents, Peck belonged to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, a secret occult society founded in the 1800s. Some notable members of the Golden Dawn include Bram Stoker and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sir William Peck was knighted by King George V in 1917 before arriving here in Warriston Cemetery in 1925. One last grave we would like to check out before we get to the Tomb of the Red Lady belongs to someone who has been described as one of the most illustrious citizens of Edinburgh, Professor James Young Simpson, who came to Edinburgh a poor and nearly friendless student, but in time attained a professor of midwifery in the University of Edinburgh and discoverer of extended uses of chloroform, a huge advancement not only in Edinburgh, but around the world. This book, published in 1882, recounts how he discovered its usefulness. It was on the 28th of November, 1847, that he became satisfied with the safety of using chloroform by experimenting on himself and two other medical men. 
Dr. Keith and Duncan, we are told, sat each with a tumbler in hand, then, in the tumbler, a napkin. Chloroform was poured upon each napkin and inhaled. Simpson, after a while, drowsy as he was, was roused by Dr. Duncan snoring and by Dr. Keith kicking about in a far from graceful way. He sat at once that he must have been sent to sleep by the chloroform. He saw his friends still under the effect. In a word, he saw that the great discovery had been made and his long labors had finally come to a successful end. It is said it was a miracle that he got the dosage right that night, as too little would have been inconclusive, and any more would have put him here much quicker. One more of the many noteworthy innovations and accolades he achieved was that he improved the design of forceps that to this day are used and known as Simpson's forceps. Sir James Young Simpson was the first ever person in the UK to be knighted for service to medicine by Queen Victoria, and he was even offered a burial place in Westminster Abbey, which he declined. He passed away from heart failure at home in May of 1870 and was laid to rest, sadly joining five of his children who arrived here before him. They estimated on the day of the funeral, the crowds of people lining the streets for the procession were around 100,000 who came from all around to pay their respects. We are now heading over to what was once an extraordinary memorial for a young woman who sadly met her fate early on. Mary Ann Robertson's tomb was erected upon her death in 1858 by her grieving father, the Brigadier General Mason of the Bombay Artillery. The shrine was built out of white marble, with the statue of a reclining woman on her deathbed inside. The roof was apparently made of ruby red glass which, when the sun would shine through, the light would flood the tomb with a red glow, hence the nickname, the Tomb of the Red Lady. While the body section of the statue still remains, the head has been damaged and is partially missing. The building that covered this had been so badly vandalized in the 1980s that it had to be taken down altogether. This is all that remains. In my research, I came across many conflicting stories about how she lost her life. From falling off a horse in India, to catching tuberculosis from her husband while she was nursing him, to being flat out murdered by her husband. There were also tales that she's been haunting the area going back to the 70s when a group of up to no good teenagers apparently had excavated her skull. But then other reports say that she was cremated in India. That being said, if you have any information on her or want to share a spooky Warston story, please leave a comment below. Next time, we finally arrive at New Haven Harbor, just in time for its spectacular sunset. Join us as we learn about its shipbuilding past and the insane history of the now extinct fishermen and fishwives of New Haven. Also, Nacho thinks it would be rough if you didn't hit that like and subscribe button. Thank you.